How are you doing? Isn't it a beautiful February evening? I wanted to talk a little bit about trees. I'm passionate about trees. We both are. And we've been lucky enough to live in areas where there's a lot of trees. You know, we've lived in woodland, we've lived in areas with orchards, we've lived in areas with unusual arboretums and specialist trees. I think one of the things we feel about that is that as much as we enjoy those, we recognise that in this country, the landscape is a man-made one. And if we're lucky enough to enjoy the trees that previous generations have planted, we have a responsibility to ensure that subsequent generations also have interesting and beautiful trees to enjoy. Now, we're not Richard Nagus, we don't have a thousand acres like some great lord of the manor, so our opportunities to do that are limited. But we've done a bit, and by way of an introduction to us and how we think, I thought it might interest you just to see a few of the trees that we planted on our pocket handkerchief of the land. And for me to explain why I think they're important or why we planted them. This absolutely beautiful tree, which we planted a few years ago now, is a medlar, known to the delight of many small boys as a dog's bum tree, because its fruit resembles that portion of canine anatomy. I've deliberately pruned it with small children in mind and it delights me to think that these branches that I've kept long and low will at some future time become an area where a small girl, perhaps my granddaughter perhaps someone else's granddaughter will sit with a doll or a teddy bear and read a book we've planted some other unusual older trees in this bed this one, perhaps more of a bush, that we should go round and round. Because this genuinely is a mulberry bush. And the tree behind it will become a mulberry tree. This is a black mulberry. The mulberries were established in the UK and passed out by the court as part of an attempt to produce habitat for silkworms. One of the problems with that of course is that this is a black mulberry which is what was propagated and what silkworms live on is a white mulberry. Um, this is a white mulberry or it will become so as it grows. But it amuses me to think of somebody passing out entirely the wrong species based on a name. This little beauty sat here in the weak spring sunshine is a quince verandia and that will produce beautiful fragrant fruit and if you do nothing else with quinces just leave them in a bowl over winter and they will perfume a room better than any potpourri they also make a wonderful thing called a quince cheese which is more of a, a pressed fruit paste that is absolutely fantastic with a sharp real cheese or with cold meats. So that's a few of the interesting old English trees. I'll take you to see some others and perhaps explain why I planted them. So this is a small wooded area planted. We don't have room for large areas, but I just thought I'd point out a few of the more interesting specimens that we're planting. This is a whole oak. Interesting because it's an evergreen. If we move along, there are more species than I have time to point out. These two are, ignore the catkins, they come from an alder, but these, which you can see, are already greening up in February, are spindle trees. And they were great favourites of ours when we lived on the South Downs. Not so much for the leaf or even the flower. But the seed pods are vibrant Barbie pink. And the seeds inside are fluorescent orange. They are an absolutely startlingly beautiful small tree. 
called spindle trees because the tight grained white wood was used for spindles. This unprepossessing stick is a true service tree. It existed in the UK at the time of the Romans and they made an alcoholic drink from it. So rare now that you cannot buy a UK based service tree. So I imported two from abroad of true service trees. And my intent, if I live long enough, is that I will make a few bottles of the alcoholic beverage brewed from the fruit of the true service tree. And it will probably be the first time that that fruit has been brewed into alcohol in a couple of thousand years. I quite look forward to that. I think that would be a very fun, if long-term, project. Move to a different part of the garden. I'll show you some other things. Here's an interesting little fella. This guy, which as you can see, is already far taller than me. We planted. And it's actually got an interesting and long history in this part of the country. Looks rather like a beach, but it isn't. It's a hornbeam. And hornbeams in Lincolnshire were planted and maintained because of the incredible hard-wearing nature of the wood of the hornbeam. And that wood was used to make the gearing of the windmills that were very prevalent in this flat and windy landscape. Next to it is a lime tree, also known as a linden. And the small leaf lime, the flowers in the small leaf lime, if brewed into a tea or a chisane, make a soporific, calming drink. Uh, so if you have one and it's in flower and you're struggling to get off to sleep, put a few of the flowers up into a warm drink and you might be surprised. This area of the garden you can see a reasonably well established orchard that we keep the hens in and Fiona over there in the background, keeping it all lovely and tidy. We uh, have planted a great deal of different varieties of fruit here. So we have apples and pears, all traditional older varieties, group C pollinators. We also have cherries, plums, gauges, uh, all manner of sort of good fruit. But, uh, yeah, we established when we first moved in and been adding to ever since. We've probably done as much as the space we have permits now. But it's nice to see. This tree is the wild service tree. Very uncommon now, partly because climate change means it struggles to propagate itself through seed in the UK. But a long history, nonetheless. Mostly now found as a hedgerow plant. Interestingly, the fruit of the wild service is known as a checker. And checkers, the name of the Prime Minister's country of treat, is so called because of the wild service trees that used to fruit there. Um, the wild service and the true service trees, um, along with this guy, which is a rowan or mountain ash, and also along with the white bean and various others, are all members of the sorbus family which actually a lot of people don't recognise now because they're far less common in the English landscape. But for a long time, different members of them were very common in hedgerows and farm boundaries. I'll show you this area. where I'll show you a new hedge I'm establishing in a minute and one other tree of interest. I'm showing you this because this whole area, when we moved in, was under blackthorn. And a blackthorn hedge had been allowed to run and run. And if you don't know, blackthorns produce suckers coming up through the ground from their roots and if you do nothing with them they turn into trees and then they push out further into the landscape. You really have to keep blackthorn under control. Now, when I told people I was grubbing out a hedge you should have heard their reactions. The point was this hedge was of very little use, limited wildlife benefit. We have plenty left. Behind me, blackthorn. So I've not removed it all but what I have done 
has made space here for walnut and beech and willow. And this one is chestnut, sweet chestnut. Fantastic properties as well as the edibility. Did you know that an acre of sweet chestnut produces as many food calories as an acre of wheat without the need for ploughing? Let me show you this tree. It's an apple. No idea what variety. It's grown locally, produces large, very large, early ripening fruit. Not great keeping qualities, but absolutely delicious. Superb for juice, good for cider. And uh, if you don't know, an apple will not produce a tree. So the pips of an apple do not produce a tree that is true to its parent, because obviously it has been pollinated by a different tree. So it's a hybrid of the tree it grows on and the tree the pollen came from. So the only way to, pr to produce a genetically identical apple tree is to take a piece of the original tree and graft it onto a new root. And that's what I did here. It feels a little bit like witchcraft to uh, attach one piece of one tree to another piece of another. But that's how you produce genetically identical apple trees. Now I could go on with this hedge. We actually planted this as an edible hedge. So it has all sorts of other interesting things in it like cherries. See one here. Uh, mountain cranberry, a little bit of yew which isn't edible but it does provide good habitat hazel and so on. So we've planted a very mixed hedge here which will provide multiple habitats and multiple food sources in place of just suckered blackthorn that was almost monoculture. I've probably gone on enough about trees but it's something I care about. I think our landscape benefits from beautiful trees. It's also something that you get no immediate or indeed personal return from. That to grow a tree well takes decades, if not centuries. But if you don't grow them, they aren't there for future generations. So, to some extent, it's selfless. I don't consider myself a selfless person, so let's think of it as payback. If I grow trees now, then perhaps I've paid back the people who grew the trees that I enjoy. And I don't have to grow them all for fruit or or for amenity value. I can grow some just because they're rare or beautiful or unusual. But all of them, hopefully, will be there for future generations to enjoy. I hope that was a little bit interesting. Maybe just gave you a flavour of what we're about. You have a great evening.